Good morning. Uh, in conjunction with Greg Wolf and Jeff Myers, and on behalf of the American Head and Neck Society, it is my honor to welcome 2,000 participants in this meeting to San Francisco and to convene the Seventh International Conference on Head and Neck Cancer. We especially welcome attendees from 56 different countries. Would all the international attendees that are here right now just stand for a moment and let us say hi? We have drawn on worldwide expertise to create the power of this meeting. Not long ago, I was talking to Dr. Rapidus from Athens, and he called this meeting the Olympics of our field. The most remarkable and enjoyable aspect of the meeting is the camaraderie and the intellectual interchange generated by our common commitment to patients with head and neck cancer. And to me, there is also an important subtext. We physicians have a role in fostering moderation and tolerance in our respective countries. Through our travels and our meetings, we set an important example of respectful international dialogue. To sustain a moment of that sort of reflection, I invited Dr. Al Johnson to offer an invocation. Al, would you come up? During his tenure as chair of the Department of Medical History and Ethics, Al was a wonderful mentor for me as I worked to develop a better understanding of the ethics of multi-institutional trials. He has an extensive background that is available in your program. To cite a few aspects of his career, he was chief of the Division of Medical Ethics here at UCSF. He was president of the University of San Francisco, a member of the Institute of Medicine and the Academy of Sciences, a member of the President's Commission for the Study of Ethical Problems in Medicine, and Commissioner of the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research. Al, thank you very much for accepting my invitation. Ernie, thank you very much, and uh, welcome to my hometown. This is my city. I, uh, I fractured my patella the other day, and uh, I guess I came to the wrong place, didn't I? <laughs> it's a perplexing honor to be invited to give the invocation at this great conference. An honor because of the quality of the audience and its purposes, but perplexing for two reasons. First, I was, but no longer am, a clergyman, um, the usual inv invocators. And secondly, because in a conference so global, the audience will be of such diverse faiths and many of no faith, that an invocation poses problems of cultural impropriety, political incorrectness, and simple irrelevance. Still, in respect to the invitation and to my good friend Ernie Waymuller, and to tradition, allow me to make a prayer. I hope it will touch those who believe and that those who do not will appreciate its concerns even if they do not share its beliefs. In 1974, when I was still a clergyman and just appointed professor of medical ethics at the medical school at UCSF, I responded to a similar invitation from a great cancer surgeon, J. Engelbert Dumphy, to give an invocation at the American College of Surgeons being held here in San Francisco. I uh, searched out that prayer when Ernie invited me to do this, and I find it just as suitable now as it was then. Thus, I repeat it with some little updating. Lord, it may be ironic to ask you to bless these surgeons. They work to repair a creation that some think you should have made perfect. Yet, whatever your motive, you did not make it perfect. It breaks, tears, deteriorates, and collapses with frightening regularity. 
Its inhabitants damage it incessantly and damage themselves by violence, toxins, immoderation, and by fostering injustices that kill, starve, and impoverish. Savants and saints from Zoroaster to Job to Augustine to Darwin have pondered vainly the mystery of evil in this fragility of creation. While remaining mysterious, it offers to us humans the opportunity to share in the divine work of creation. The unfinished, the damaged, the debilitated present the possibility of a new creation. The Judeo-Christian Islamic traditions proclaim that the first creation issued from your infinite power and unselfish love. The recreation worked by surgery issues from painfully acquired skills rather than from infinite power. Yet unselfish love must be reflected in the surgeon's desire to cure and to care, in his concern for his patient as a person, in sacrifices of time and energy to affect the health of fragile humans. Our traditions relate that you performed the first surgery, a costectomy, in the Garden of Eden. And you are aware that sequelae are often not satisfactory. May these surgeons recognize that their patients' incisions will best heal when their spirits are whole and their lives secure. Those we ask you to create and sustain the skill of hand and love of heart, which makes surgeons human colleagues in creation. We ask you, Father, Yahweh, Allah, the power surpassing all finite power, to hear us and bless us. Amen. Take care going down yep. those stairs. Okay? I sure will. Thank you very much, Al. As noted in the program, the original conference was held in Baltimore in 1984 under the leadership of Paul Credian, who will be further recognized by Greg Wolf later in the program. As you see, Greg had a major role in the original meeting, and now 24 years later, I have enjoyed sharing the leadership of this meeting during Greg's presidential year. I attended the 1984 meeting with Charlie Cummings, and I've been to every one since. In 1988, Bill Fee in Boston was our conference chair. In San Francisco in 1992, Charlie Cummings and Mike Flynn shared the leadership. In 1996, Jatin Shah led the meeting in Toronto. At the Millennium, we made our second visit to San Francisco with Jonas Johnson as the conference chair. In 2004, I had the honor of supporting Ashok Shaha's leadership in Washington, D.C. This year, we are participating in what I believe is a landmark and transformative meeting made unique by the active participation of each major society involved in head and neck work. You will note that this is a head and neck cancer meeting, not a head and neck surgery meeting. The participation of each group underscores the critical importance of multidisciplinary cooperation in patient care, education, and research. We deeply appreciate the active involvement of the leaders and the members of ASCO, ASTRO, and ASHNR. Doctors Coltrera, Irish, and Sturgis worked exceedingly well to coordinate the work of our scientific review committee that received over 1,200 abstracts. Mark, John, and Eric brought this major part of the program together during a long, cool weekend in Seattle earlier this year. 
you will find the 400 proffered papers and 700 posters a wealth of new information. All of us in the executive group will agree Jennifer Clark and the BSC team provided outstanding meeting support. They are well organized, responsive, and from every perspective they have been a critical element in the success of this meeting. I also wanted to say thanks to Jay Boyle, who helped us with corporate support. We thank the platinum and gold sponsors, as well as the silver and bronze sponsors. I hope each of you will take the time to visit the exhibit hall uh, and benefit from that visit. Also a reminder that you are invited to major social events t tonight and Tuesday night. And the Spouse Lounge is available out in the outside lobby today, tomorrow, and Tuesday. And speaking of spouses, I'm delighted that Alice and our sons, Ye and Sims, and their wives, Rochelle and Stacy, are here. I hope many of you will meet them at the reception tonight. <clears throat> A major perk in chairing this meeting is the privilege of inviting Charlie Cummings to be my honored guest. He is the embodiment of his personal mantra, tenacity and commitment will prevail. Charlie was past chairman of two departments, the University of Washington and following that, Johns Hopkins University. He was a director of the American Board of Otolaryngology, a past president of the American Society of Head and Neck Surgeons, past president of our academy. As you noted, he was the conference chair here in 1992. He is the editor-in-chief of the four-volume text on otolaryngology, head neck surgery, and currently is executive director of international medicine at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. For nearly 40 years, he has been my friend and mentor <clears throat> and revered competitor. I know without his stimulus and support and guidance that I would not be here in this position today. <clears throat> and the award reads, for your profound influence on education, research, patient care, and international communication in the field of head and neck cancer. I thought I'd do it, but I didn't really do it. Thank you. I don't think I can uh, do any better than Ernie, so I'm just going to say thank you. And, and the, the privilege of uh, being among colleagues like you all and the opportunity to treat patients is God's greatest gift, except having true friendship which is what Ernie and I have. Thank you. In closing, it is my pleasure to invite your program chair and the conference chair for 2012, Jeff Myers, to the podium. Jeff was the catalyst for taking this meeting to its new level of multidisciplinary participation. He worked incredibly hard to achieve the success that I know you will appreciate in the next four days. Jeff, thank you for doing an outstanding job. Thank you, Ernie. And on behalf of the Head and Neck Society, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for your attendance and participation and over the next few minutes, I'm going to give an overview of what to expect for the meeting for the next four days. So um, this is uh, speaking on behalf also of a large multidisciplinary, multinational team that helped put this program together. And as uh, Ernie mentioned, the theme of this meeting really is multidisciplinary hair, care in head and neck cancer, because that's the way we practice at our own institutions is in a multidisciplinary way. Um, these slides will be a little bit uh, difficult to see, but all this information is in your program. 
it's a little too much to cram on one slide the activities of each day, but you'll see that each day has a certain theme uh, to it, both in terms of uh, the multidisciplinary content. So today we're leading off with uh, radiology and imaging as the major theme. On Monday, we'll focus more on topics related to medical oncology. Tuesday will be dedicated to radiation oncology, and uh, Wednesday will be for head and neck surgery and uh, scientific sessions. But there will be multidisciplinary and surgical sessions and all the different topics mingled throughout all the days. And each day we'll start out in this room with keynote addresses, and I'll go through the keynote speakers for each day uh, as we go through each day. Then we'll be um, breaking up into different rooms where we'll have scientific sessions, and we'll have a mix of panels as well as proffered papers ongoing simultaneously. It's a, it'll be a little frustrating at times because there will be a lot of things that you'll want to see and participate in, but without making it a 12-day meeting, that's the best we can do. So uh, then at lunchtime, we have some smaller sessions where you can buy tickets for a, a lunch with the professor session. And these, again, are organized by themes. There's some surgical topics on every day, but today there are topics related to imaging, tomorrow related to uh, medical oncology, Tuesday radiation. And if you want tickets, you can buy them at the registration desk. These tend to be smaller sessions and a little less formal. And there's time for dialogue and interaction with the, uh, the leaders of those sessions. And you can refer to your program to see each day what the offerings are for a lunch with the professor. So today's uh, keynotes will be given by uh, Dr. Carolyn Dressler on uh, topics on uh, global issues, and then we'll hear from Dr. Hudgens, who has been our program chair for imaging topics, and she's going to talk about molecular and physiologic issues. The future is now. So as I mentioned, the uh, overview of Monday, this topic will be more related to medical oncology. Next slide. And we will hear Dr. Wolf's presidential address that day, which will be on um, tailored treatment, teamwork, trade-offs, and tradition, head and neck surgical oncology in the genomics era. Uh, Dr. Grandis, Jennifer Grandis from University of Pittsburgh, will talk about targeting signaling pathways in head and neck cancer. And uh, we'll have our first uh, ever Christopher O'Brien lecture will be given by Dr. Donald Morton on uh, management of malignant melanoma. The keynote speakers on Tuesday, which is a day for radiation topics, include Dr. William Way, who will give the New York Head and Neck Society lecture on nasopharyngeal cancer, followed by uh, Jens Overgaard, who will give a, a keynote lecture on the subject of radiation therapy. And we'll have the Hayes Martin lecture, and I think this is the one of the first times it's given by a, a non-head and neck surgeon, and he'll be talking about Dr. Wang Ki Hong from MD Anderson will talk about head and neck cancer in the 21st century, molecular targets for treatment and prevention. And Wednesday is a half day, but it's a day uh, we think everyone will want to attend because we have two additional uh, outstanding keynotes. One will be on epigenetics and oral cancer by Dr. Richard uh, Shaw from uh, England, followed by the first Milton Dance lecture on the evaluation management of the neck by uh, Dr. Lehmans from the Netherlands. There will also be some uh, very important panels that are really um, both in scientific topics but also topics related to patient care in the areas of uh, thyroid cancer and salivary cancers and we know you want to stick around to, to see those topics and we hope that you will. Um, I wanted to uh, go through and thank a lot of the people that you've heard about already because of all their contributions to the meeting. It was a pleasure to work under Dr. Weimuller's gu uh, guidance, and he had the appropriate balance of giving me strong leadership and autonomy to develop the program, and I'm grateful to him for that. Um, Jonathan Irish did a tremendous job of putting together these proffered paper sessions, and you'll see they're very complex. There's many of them going on all the time with different themes. and. He worked uh, 
very closely actually with Eric Sturgis in developing the program and distributing things between proffered papers and posters and grateful to both of them for their, uh, their hard work and efforts. Uh, another similarly uh, hardworking and dedicated individual to this meeting has been Mark Coltrera, who's been the informatics and technology chair and helped do a lot of the uh, complex computer sorting and uh, distributing information about uh, ranking and, and distributing the information about who's going to give posters and talks and things of that, like, like that. And we're grateful to him, so thank you, Mark. Um, next slide. So we had several program chairs in the area of radiation oncology. Paul Harari and Kianong gave uh, a lot of guidance and input and helped select those topics and speakers in those sessions. From medical oncology, Merrill Keyes and Arlene Forestier uh, provided a lot of uh, support and input. Uh, Pat Hudgens, I mentioned already, and Suresh Mukherjee, who will introduce her talk, was uh, also very valuable in assisting us. Jennifer Grandis provided some expertise in basic and translational research aspects of the program. And in the areas of rehabilitation and quality of life, Bevin Ye and uh, Jan Lewin um, provided a lot of input. Next slide. So you can't, probably can't read this, but this again is in your uh, hand, hand, uh, program book, but the important thing to see is just how many people we had from all over the world, from different disciplines, contribute and help guide us in putting together this program. And they did a lot of work and we're grateful uh, to all of them and you know, welcome some of them back to, uh, or, or to suggest other people that would be appropriate to be on the program committee for the 2012 meeting. Um, we were very fortunate to have BSC helping us. Their professionalism, expertise, and dedication to this meeting are outstanding. And for four years, Jennifer Clark uh, particularly, and uh, others, Aaron Goodman, uh, Teresa Chen, Shelley Ginsburg, Christina Kassendorf, have contributed to, to this uh, just outstanding venue and entertainment and a lot of the technical behind-the-scenes aspects of making this meeting work. So th thank you. Uh, to all of you for that. Um, our sponsors, uh, we're very grateful to. We've had a kind of robust response from our sponsors who have really helped this meeting to be successful. And uh, more and more as time moves on, I think we'll, that we'll rely on them uh, more so that we can have these types of meetings and bring the types of people we want to uh, give the keynotes and other talks. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Finally, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, National Institutes of Health, the uh, NIDCR, National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research, as well as the National Cancer Institute for supporting an R13 award uh, for travel grants. We've given 20 travel awards to young investigators who were presenting at this meeting. There were so many applicants that were excellent. I think we had 67 applicants for the 20 uh, spots. It was hard to choose amongst them. We tried to achieve an appropriate balance of certainly merit of the quality of the presentations in an objective way and also trying to get people from the different disciplines, different levels of training and uh, different institutions. So uh, congratulations to those who won those travel awards and uh, welcome. Um, my final comments as I leave the podium here just to mention that uh, part of our uh, support from our sponsors was to have several satellite symposia that go along with this meeting. And again, they're on this orange sheet that uh, came along with your bag and your program. And those will start tomorrow. For, uh, some of them are uh, for the early risers and start at 6.30 in the morning. Tomorrow there will be a, a session at 6.30 in the Yerba Salons 4 through 6 on new approaches to multi uh, modal treatment of head and neck cancer, and that's supported by um, educational uh, grant from the Center for Biomedical Continuing Education and Bristol Myers Squibb and Santa Fe Aventis. Tomorrow evening at 7.30 in the Yerba Salons 1 through 3, there's a session on transoral laser microsurgery, and this is supported by OmniGuide. And then on Tuesday, there are uh, concurrent 6.30 a.m. sessions. The first will be on a new paradigm for treatment of head and neck cancer, which is sponsored by our IRX Therapeutics. And there will also be a session on a call to action, assessing new standards of care in advanced head and neck cancer, which is supported 
uh, also by Bristol Myers Squibb and MCLONE. So welcome you to those events as well as uh, the next four days of this meeting. Have a good time. Give us feedback where uh, we can do better for next time. We know things will be good but not perfect and we want to keep improving and making a good meeting for you. So thank you. Good morning. I'm Greg Wolf, and uh, it's been my honor and pleasure to serve as president of the American Head and Neck Society this year. And on behalf of the society, I echo Ernie's welcome and welcome you to this, uh, what uh, we expect is going to be just a terrific, outstanding uh, meeting. Dr. Weimuller has already uh, noted some of the important leaders that were involved in organizing uh, this conference over the past 24 years, uh, but uh, it would be somewhat remiss of me not to make a special note of some of the seminal events. Could I have my first slide, please? Not that group, it's the tribute slides. We'll get to Dr. Carey. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I've taken this prerogative to uh, make some special note of some of the events that were associated with the birth of this meeting uh, many, many years ago. And it's really the story of the vision of uh, one particular man who was both a mentor and a friend. Let's see if that changes it. There it goes. And so on the occasion of this seventh international meeting, um, I offer some special recognition to uh, Paul B. Credian, who was the key individual responsible for initiating this uh, great series of meetings. I feel particularly uh, predisposed to relate these events since uh, I was there to witness uh, all of them. As a young uh, otolaryngology residency graduate, I ventured to the National Cancer Institute to do a tumor immunology fellowship with Paul in his laboratory at the surgery branch of NCI. Clinically, this was a particularly exciting uh, time for us because this was a time when advances, surgical advances in pedicled myocutaneous flaps were just coming out and uh, multi-drug uh, uh, chemotherapy regimens were being introduced into uh, routine treatment for previously untreated patients with head and neck cancer. And so while I was at the NCI, uh, Paul and I discussed the need for organizing a meeting to discuss these uh, various research advances. And this led to the first research workshop, which unfortunately or fortunately fell on my shoulders to organize because Paul Credian was uh, recovering from a long illness uh, after contracting a Giardia infection on one of his trips to India. And although this first research workshop was a success, it really didn't fulfill Paul's vision of uh, a major multidisciplinary clinical meeting, much on the scale of the College of Surgeons or on the scale of an ASCO meeting. So in the spring of 1981, we invited the leadership of then the two head and neck societies to meet in Ann Arbor for a one-day meeting on Chuck Krause's uh, back deck. As you can see from the picture, the important leaders in surgical uh, head, and neck, uh, head and neck surgery were present at that time, including uh, Daryl Jakes from Baltimore, uh, Paul Credian, of course, Chuck Krause, uh, Paul Ward, Elliot Strong, uh, and Tom Carey, and uh, Mike Johns. And it really took someone with the respect and credibility of a Paul Credian to pull this off and to uh, bring these uh, two societies together and put society politics aside. Paul was viewed as a leader in head and neck research and although he trained as a general surgeon, he appreciated the strengths that both the Society of Head and Neck Surgeons and the American Society for Head and Neck Surgery brought to the table. And thus, in 1984, the first international conference on head and neck cancer was uh, born. Paul continued to play an important role in the organization of the next several conferences and in promoting collaboration of these two great surgical societies. And as you may see, this little logo up in the corner is really a carryover from the first research workshop. And so you might ask, why is this important at this particular time? Well, I think it's important 
it's particularly important because this is a story that really involves two great uh, head and neck societies. And I believe that the cooperation, the camaraderie, the trust, and the success experienced by these two societies related to the early conferences was a significant catalyst to the eventual merger of these two great societies 14 years later in uh, 1998. And so the history of this conference, the International Conference, is interwoven with the history of these two great head and neck societies. And this year we celebrate the 10-year anniversary of the birth of the American Head and Neck Society and Ashok Shah and Tom Robbins, who were the first co-presidents of this society, will detail uh, um, and will provide a little more detail about the history of this uh, organization on Wednesday morning at the opening of that session, so I invite you to attend. It also happens to be 50 years since the birth of the American Society for Head and Neck Surgery and 54 years since the birth of the Society of Head and Neck Surgeons. Unfortunately, uh, Paul Credian couldn't be with us today to celebrate these various beginnings because of personal health issues that were related to a pelvic fracture and a rotator cuff injury from a recent fall that have made it impossible for him to travel. But despite that, I do take this occasion to formally and warmly thank him for his vision and to offer this special recognition, recognition of his lifelong commitment to patients with head and neck cancer, to interdisciplinary care, and to surgical education that allowed him to overcome specialty barriers in politics and create an ongoing forum for scientific exchange, research, and education that we now call the International Conference on Head and Neck Cancer. So Paul, thank you very much in absentia. Now, could I have that next group of slides? It's a particular uh, uh, pleasure and honor uh, as president to be able to cite a number of individuals uh, that have contributed uh, both to uh, my success and to our treatment successes in head and neck cancer. And so on the occasion of this uh, meeting, I've selected a, a, a number of individuals that represent the uh, multidisciplinary spectrum of care in head and neck cancer. Uh, this morning I'm pleased to honor and recognize Tom Carey for his lifelong contributions to head and neck cancer biology. Tom studied head and neck cancer squamous carcinoma for over 30 years. He established the first and the largest repository of cultured head and neck cancer cell lines and he shared these cell lines worldwide, thus extending the influence of his innovations and his discovery. He's mentored uh, numerous students at Michigan. He's been a constant supporter and a mentor to fellow scientists throughout the world who study head and neck cancer. This is Tom mentoring his wife, uh, Colleen. In addition to specific discoveries of squamous cell carcinoma antigenic phenotypes, new tumor suppressor genes, and gene markers of chemotherapy resistance, Tom's also made several discoveries in the mechanisms responsible for sudden deafness. In all of this work, he has kept a constant focus on the patient and the clinical problems that we face in advancing medicine. He symbolizes what translational research and team science is all about. On behalf of the American Head and Neck Society and in recognition of lifelong contributions to the basic biology of squamous carcinoma, I'm pleased to offer Tom this presidential citation. Tom? Leadership in head and neck oncology takes many forms. For Arlene Forestier, it starts with attention to the patient, study the, studying the disease, and collaborating with colleagues. In her early career at the University of Michigan, she frequently evaluated patients together in the clinic with the surgeons. Through team meetings, tumor boards, and retreats, she led the group to consensus as they relied on her to design both innovative and effective clinical trials. She took these experiences and expanded them to successful leadership of national clinical research efforts in cooperative groups such as the ECOG and the RTOG, 
and for the NCI Intergroup Committee. Her landmark intergroup organ preservation trial established chemotherapy and radiation as a standard therapy for patients with advanced laryngeal cancer and uh, has the distinction of being one of very few head and neck clinical trials ever to be presented at the plenary session of an annual ASCO meeting. She's continued her national leadership in ASCO and currently serves as the chair of the National Cancer Center Network Head and Neck Guidelines Panel. Uh, she also is one of the co-chairs of the newly instituted National Cancer Institute Head and Neck Cancer Steering Committee. For her consistent dedication to better treatment for our patients and commitment to leadership in clinical trial and translational research, we recognize her today with this presidential citation. Arlene. The modern research team in head and neck cancer needs a steadying voice, an unbiased critic, and an objective evaluator. This role is often filled by the bi biostatistician. Susan Fisher, who I'm going to honor next, is professor and chair of the Department of Community and Preventive Medicine at the University of Rochester and chief of the Division of Epidemiology. As a biostatistician and clinical investigator, Susan has maintained a career-long interest in head and neck cancer going back to her early beginnings, and she won't like me to mention this, as a nurse at the NCI where she provided intensive care nursing support to patients with head and neck cancer. In her life as a biostatistician, she's provided essential, invaluable assistance to the, in the design and conduct of several national multi-institutional clinical trials, including the VA laryngeal cancer trial. She has provided assistance in numerous biomarker-related laboratory studies for our team at Michigan, and uh, for the last six years has served as an external advisor to the University of Michigan Head and Neck Spore Program. She's a wonderful uh, educator of clinicians in the subtleties and the practicalities of statistics. She's a skilled investigator in her own right and a superb collaborator. For her many contributions to progress in head and neck cancer treatment and for sustained team science, I'm pleased to recognize uh, Susan Fisher with this presidential citation. Susan. It's not often that uh, one individual can take several innovative ideas from concept to clinical trial and then on to publication and do it with such clarity and impact that these improvements are readily accepted by one's colleagues. Dr. Avi Eisbrook is just such an individual. Avi is a professor of radiation oncology at the University of Michigan, where he joined the faculty after postgraduate training in both radiation oncology at Washington University and after fellowship in medical oncology at the MD Anderson Hospital. At Michigan, Avi pioneered the adoption of parotid sparing radiation fields. He convinced us surgeons that tumor control rates were just as good and xerostomia significantly reduced with these technical modifications. He extended these quality of life improvements to sparing of the pharyngeal musculature now made possible with IMRT and 3D conformal techniques, uh, which is resulting now in significant long-term swallowing improvements in patients who undergo chemoradiation. He is an exceptional clinician a wonderful collaborator, an effective but quiet leader in his own specialty. And he's a true example of what teamwork can accomplish. In recognition of his ongoing efforts to improve treatment results and quality of life for our patients, uh, we recognize Dr. Avi Eisbrook with this uh, presidential citation. Avi.
As uh, president, I also get to, uh, uh, on an annual basis, the president gets to pick a distinguished uh, service awardee uh, uh, recipient to recognize. And uh, today we recognize another unique individual that has made uh, significant contributions to our specialty over a great number of years. And that individual is uh, Helmuth Gepfert. Interestingly, Helmuth uh, came to surgical oncology with a background in both medical oncology and radiation oncology. Many of you don't, maybe don't know that. And early on in his career at the University of Texas at Houston and at the MD Anderson Hospital, he was instrumental in establishing the important role of the surgeon in leading the multidisciplinary treatment team and integrating translational science. Moreover, he's been a surgical educator worldwide. And although he's recently retired, he continues to mentor and influence young surgeons. As a part of his ongoing commitment to education, he recently donated his completed electronic textbook of head and neck oncology to the American Head and Neck Society for placement on our website. This text will be a keystone in our initial efforts to provide web-based point of learning electronic information uh, for our head and neck oncology members. For his many contributions to head and neck surgical education and his generous support of our society's educational efforts, we're pleased to recognize him again with the American Head and Neck Society Distinguished Service Award. It's my great pleasure as president to do that today. Unfortunately, Helmuth couldn't be here to receive the award, but accepting on his behalf is Dr. Gary Clayman. Gary? As you know, Helmuth, he's never at a loss for words, so he sent his spokesperson. Yeah. And uh, I don't have a Chilean German accent, so please accept this. Uh, Helmuth is sorry he can't attend personally and accept this award. He wishes to express that without the constant support of his faculty, trainees, and staff during his tenure at MD Anderson Cancer Center in the head and neck cancer team, including his chairmanship there of the Department of Head and Neck Surgery for 22 years, None of this would have been credited without their uh, efforts. Thank you, and have a great meeting. Thank you so much, Gary. I have one other item of business. Um, I'd like to make a special note of the generosity of Carolyn Dressler, who is our, this year, our invited John Conley lecturer. Carolyn declined the honorarium that typically accompanies the Conley lectureship, and that generosity has allowed the society uh, to um, invite a, select and invite a deserving young surgeon from an underserved area of the world to be sponsored to attend this international meeting. With the help of Pat Galane and Johan Fagan, uh, we selected Joyce Keneally Aswani to join us at this meeting as our special guest. Joyce recently completed the Carl Stortz Head and Neck Fellowship with Dr. Fagan at the University of Cape Town and is now a practicing otolaryngologist head and neck surgeon at the major teaching hospital in Nairobi, the Kenyatta National Hospital. And so it's with great pleasure that we welcome Joyce to this meeting and thank her for making the long journey to San Francisco to be with us. Joyce, welcome. And now, without further ado, I'm going to turn the podium back to uh, Ernie for concluding remarks to this opening ceremony. Ernie. Well, um, all I uh, have to say at this point is that we will re reconvene shortly for the first keynote. Uh, there are refreshments outside, so look forward to enjoying the meeting with you for the next four days. Thank you.